Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka, Part 1 When Gregor Samsa woke up one morning from unsettling dreams, he found himself changed in his bed into a monstrous vermin. He was lying on his back as hard as armor plate, and when he lifted his head a little, he saw his vaulted brown belly sectioned by arch-shaped ribs to whose dome the cover, about to slide off completely, could barely cling. His many legs, pitifully thin compared with the size of the rest of him, were waving helplessly before his eyes. What's happened to me? he thought. It was no dream. His room, a regular human room, only a little on the small side, lay quiet between the four familiar walls. Over the table, on which an unpacked line of fabric samples was all spread out, Samsa was a travelling salesman, hung the picture which he'd recently cut out of a glossy magazine and lodged into a pretty gilt frame. It showed a lady done up in a fur hat and a fur boa, sitting upright and raising up against the viewer a heavy fur muff in which her whole forearm had disappeared. Gregor's eyes then turned to the window, and the overcast weather, he could hear raindrops hitting against the metal window ledge, completely depressed him. How about going back to sleep for a few minutes and just forgetting about all this nonsense, he thought. But that was completely impractical, since he was used to sleeping on his right side, and in his present state could not get into that position. No matter how hard he threw himself onto his right side, he always rocked onto his back again. He must have tried it a hundred times, closing his eyes so as not to have to see his squirming legs and stopped only when he began to feel a slight, dull pain in his side, which he had never felt before. Oh God, he thought, what a grueling job I've picked. Day in, day out, on the road. The upset of doing business is so much worse than the actual business in the home office, and besides... I've got the torture of traveling, worrying about changing trains, eating miserable food at all hours, constantly seeing new faces, no relationships that last or get more intimate. To the devil with it all. He felt a slight itching up on top of his belly, shoved himself slowly on his back closer to the bedpost so as to be able to lift his head better, found the itchy spot studded with small white dots which he had no idea what to make of, and wanted to touch the spot with one of his legs, but immediately pulled it back for the contact sent a cold shiver through him. He slid back again into his original position. This getting up so early, he thought, makes anyone a complete idiot. Human beings have to have their sleep. Other traveling salesmen live like harem women, for instance, when I go back to the hotel before lunch to write up the business I've done, these gentlemen are just having breakfast. That's all I'd have to try with my boss. I'd be fired on the spot. Anyway, who knows if that wouldn't be a very good thing for me. If I didn't hold back for my parents' sake, I would have quit this shit a long time ago. I would have marched up to the boss and spoken my piece from the bottom of my heart. He would have fallen right off his desk. It is funny too, the way he sits on the desk and talks down from the heights to the employees, especially when they have to come right up close on account of the bosses being hard of hearing. Well, I haven't given up hope just yet. Once I've gotten the money together to pay off my parents' debt to him, that will probably take another five or six years, I'm going to do it without fail. Then I'm going to make the big break. But for the time being, I'd better get up since my train leaves at five. Gregor looked over at the alarm clock, which was ticking on the chest of drawers. God almighty, he thought. It was 6.30, and the hands were quietly moving forward. Actually, it was past the half hour. It was already nearly a quarter to. Could it be that the alarm hadn't gone off? You could see from the bed that it was set correctly for four o'clock. It had certainly gone off, too. 
Yes, but was it possible to sleep quietly through a ringing that made the furniture shake? Well, he certainly hadn't slept quietly, but probably all the more soundly for that. But what should he do now? The next train left at 7 o'clock. To make it, he would have to hurry like a madman, and the line of samples weren't even packed yet, and he himself didn't feel especially fresh and ready to march around. And even if he did make the train, he could not avoid getting it from the boss because the messenger boy had been waiting at the 5 o'clock train and would have long ago reported him for not showing up. He was a tool of the boss, without brains or backbone. What if he were to say he was sick? But that would be extremely embarrassing and suspicious because during all of his five years with the firm, Grego had never been sick, not even once. The boss would be sure to come with the health insurance doctor, blame his parents for their lazy son, and cut off all excuses by quoting the health insurance doctor, for whom the world consisted of people who were completely healthy but afraid to work. And besides, in this case, would he be so very wrong? In fact, Gregor felt fine, with the exception of his drowsiness, which was really unnecessary after sleeping so late, and he even had a ravenous appetite. Just as he was thinking all of this over at top speed, without being able to decide to get out of bed, the alarm clock had just struck a quarter to seven. He heard a cautious knocking at the door next to the head of his bed. Gregor? Someone called. It was his mother. It's a quarter to seven. Didn't you want to catch the train? What a soft voice. Gregor was shocked to hear his own voice answering. Unmistakably, his own voice, true, but in which, as if from below an insistent distress chirping intruded, which left the clarity of his words intact only for a moment, really, before so badly garbling them as they carried that no one could be sure if he had heard right. Gregor had wanted to answer in detail and to explain everything, but, given the circumstances, confined himself to saying, Yes, yes, thanks, mother. I'm just getting up now. The wooden door must have prevented the change in Gregor's voice from being noticed outside, because his mother was satisfied with this explanation and shuffled off. But their little exchange had made the rest of the family aware that, contrary to expectations, Gregor was still in the house, and already his father was knocking on one of the side doors, feebly but with his fist. Gregor? Gregor? he called. What's going on? And after a little while, he called again in a deeper warning voice. Gregor? Gregor? At the other side door, however, his sister moaned gently. Gregor, is something the matter with you? Do you need anything? Towards both sides, Gregor answered, I'm all ready, and made an effort by meticulous pronunciation and by inserting long pauses between individual words to eliminate everything from his voice that might betray him. His father went back to his breakfast, but his sister whispered, Gregor, open up, I'm pleading with you. But Gregor had absolutely no intention of opening the door and complimented himself instead on the precaution he had adopted from his business trips of locking all the doors during the night, even at home. First of all, he wanted to get up quietly, without any excitement, get dressed, and the main thing, have breakfast, and only then think about what to do next, for he saw clearly that in bed he would never think things through to a rational conclusion. He remembered how, even in the past, he had often felt some kind of slight pain, possibly caused by lying in an uncomfortable position, which, when he got up, turned out to be purely imaginary, and he was eager to see how today's fantasy would gradually fade away. That the change in his voice was nothing more than the first sign of a bad cold, an occupational ailment of the travelling salesman, he had no doubt in the least. It was very easy to throw off the cover. All he had to do was puff himself up a little, and it fell off by itself. 
But after this, things got difficult, especially since he was so unusually broad. He would have needed hands and arms to lift himself up, but instead of that he had only his numerous little legs, which were in every different kind of perpetual motion and which, besides, he could not control. If he wanted to bend one of his legs, the first thing that happened was that it stretched itself out, and if he finally succeeded in getting this leg to do what he wanted, all the others in the meantime, as if set free, began to work in the most intensely painful agitation. Just don't stay in bed being useless, Gregor said to himself. First, he tried to get out of bed with the lower part of his body, but this lower part, which, by the way, he had not yet seen, and which he could not form a clear picture of, proved too difficult to budge. It was taking so long, and when finally... Almost out of his mind, he lunged forward with all of his force, without caring. He had picked the wrong direction and slammed himself violently against the lower bedpost, and the searing pain he felt taught him that exactly the lower part of his body was, for the moment anyway, the most sensitive. He therefore tried to get the upper part of his body out of bed first, and warily turned his head towards the edge of the bed. This worked easily, and in spite of its width and weight, the mass of his body finally followed, slowly, the movement of his head. But, when at last he stuck his head over the edge of the bed, into the air, he got too scared to continue any further, since if he finally let himself fall in this position, it would be a miracle if he didn't injure his head. And just now, he had better not, for the life of him, lose consciousness. He would rather stay in bed. But when, once again, after the same exertion, he lay in his original position, sighing, and again watched his little legs struggling, if possible more fiercely, with each other and saw no way of bringing peace and order into this mindless motion, he again told himself that it was impossible for him to stay in bed and that the most rational thing was to make any sacrifice for even the smallest hope of freeing himself from the bed. But at the same time, he did not forget to remind himself occasionally that thinking things over calmly, indeed, as calmly as possible, was much better than jumping to desperate decisions. At such moments, he fixed his eyes as sharply as possible on the window, but unfortunately, there was very little confidence and cheer to be gotten from the view of the morning fog which shrouded even the other side of the narrow street. Seven o'clock already, he said to himself as the alarm clock struck again. Seven o'clock already and still such a fog. And for a little while, he lay quietly, breathing shallowly, as if expecting, perhaps, from the complete silence, the return of things to the way they really and naturally were. But then he said to himself, Before it strikes a quarter past seven, I must be completely out of bed without fail. Anyway, by that time, someone from the firm will be here to find out where I am, since the office opens before seven. And now he started rocking the complete length of his body out of the bed with a smooth rhythm. If he let himself topple out of bed in this way, his head, which on falling he planned, which on falling he planned to lift up sharply, would presumably remain unharmed. His back seemed to be hard. Nothing was likely to happen to it when it fell onto the carpet. His biggest misgiving came from his concern about the loud crash that was bound to occur and would probably create, if not terror, at least anxiety behind all the doors. But that would have to be risked. When Gregor's body already projected halfway out the bed, the new method was more of a game than a struggle. He had only to keep on rocking and jerking himself along. He thought how simple everything would be if he could get some help. Just two strong people, he thought of his father and the maid, would have been completely sufficient. They would only have to shove their arms under his arched back, in this way, scoop him off the bed, bend down with their burden, 
and then just be careful and patient while he managed to swing himself down onto the floor, where his little legs would hopefully acquire some purpose. Well, leaving out the fact that the doors were locked, should he really call for help? In spite of all his miseries, he could not repress a smile at this thought. He was already so far along that when he rocked more strongly, he could hardly keep his balance, and very soon he would have to commit himself, because in five minutes it would be a quarter past seven, when the doorbell rang. It's someone from the firm, he said to himself, and almost froze, while his little legs only danced more quickly. For a moment, everything remained quiet. They're not going to answer. Gregor said to himself, captivated by some senseless hope. But then, of course, the maid went to the door, as usual, with her firm stride and opened up. Gregor only had to hear the visitor's first word of greeting to know who it was, the office manager himself. Why was only Gregor condemned to work for a firm where at the slightest omission they immediately suspected the worst? Were all employees louts without exception? Wasn't there a single loyal, dedicated worker among them who, when he had not fully utilized a few hours of the morning for the firm, was driven half mad by pangs of conscience and was actually unable to get out of bed? Really? Wouldn't it have been enough to send one of the apprentices to find out, if this prying were even necessary, Did the manager himself have to come, and did the whole innocent family have to be shown in this way that the investigation of this suspicious affair could be entrusted only to the intellect of the manager? And more as a result of the excitement produced in Gregor by these thoughts than as a result of any real decision, he swung himself out of bed with all his might. There was a loud thump, but it was not a real crash. The fall was broken a little by the carpet, and Gregor's back was more elastic than he had thought, which explained the not very noticeable muffled sound. Only, he had not held his head carefully enough and hit it. He turned it and rubbed it on the carpet in anger and pain. Something fell in there, said the manager in the room on the left. Gregor tried to imagine whether something like what had happened to him today Could one day happen even to the manager? You really had to grant the possibility. But, as if in rude reply to this question, the manager took a few decisive steps in the next room and made his patent leather boots creak. From the room on the right, his sister whispered to inform Gregor, Gregor, the manager is here. I know, Gregor said to himself but he did not dare raise his voice enough for his sister to hear. Gregor, his father now said from the room on the left, the manager has come and wants to be informed why you didn't catch the early train. We don't know what we should say to him. And besides, he wants to speak to you personally, so please just open the door. He will certainly be so kind as to excuse the disorder of the room. Good morning, Mr. Samsa the manager called in a friendly voice. There's something the matter with him, his mother said to the manager while his father was still at the door. Believe me, sir, there's something the matter with him. Otherwise, how would Gregor have missed a train? That boy has nothing on his mind but work. It's almost begun to rile me the way that he never even leaves the house. He's been back in the city for eight days now, but every night he's been home. He sits there with us at the table, quietly reading the paper or studying timetables. It's already a distraction for him when he's busy working with his fret saw. For instance, in the span of two or three evenings, he literally carved a little frame. You'll be amazed how pretty it is. It's hanging inside his room. You'll see it right away when Gregor opens the door. You know, I'm glad you've come, sir. We would never have gotten Gregor to open the door by ourselves. He's so stubborn, and there's certainly something wrong with him, even though this morning there wasn't. I'm... I'm coming right away, said Gregor, slowly and deliberately, not moving in order not to miss a word of the conversation. 
I haven't any other explanation myself, said the manager. I hope it's nothing serious. On the other hand, I must say that we businessmen, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever you prefer, very often simply have to overcome a slight indisposition for business reasons. So can the manager come in now? asked his father, impatient, and knocked on the door again. No, said Gregor. In the room on the left, there was an embarrassing silence. In the room on the right, his sister began to sob. Why didn't his sister go in to the others? She had probably just gotten out of bed and not even started to get dressed. So what was she crying about? Because he didn't get up and he didn't let the manager in? Because he was in danger of losing his job? And because the boss would start hounding his parents about the old debts? For the time being, certainly, her worries were unnecessary. Gregor was still here and hadn't the slightest intention of letting the family down. True, at the moment he was lying on the carpet, and no one knowing his condition could seriously have expected him to let the manager in. But just because of the slight discourtesy, for which an appropriate excuse would easily be found later on, Gregor could simply not be dismissed. And to Gregor, it seemed much more sensible to just leave him alone right now than to bother him with crying and persuasion. But it was just the uncertainty that was tormenting the others and excused their behaviour. Mr. Samsa, the manager now called, raising his voice, what is the matter with you? You barricade yourself in your room, answer only yes and no, you've caused your parents serious unnecessary worry, and you neglect, and I mention this only in passing, you neglect your duties to the firm in a really shocking manner. I'm speaking here in the name of your parents and of your employer, and ask you in all seriousness for an immediate and clear explanation. I'm honestly amazed. I'm amazed. I thought I knew you to be a quiet and reasonable person, and now you suddenly seem to want to start strutting about, flaunting strange whims. The head of the firm did suggest to me this morning a possible explanation for your tardiness. It concerned the cash payments recently entrusted to you, but really, I practically gave my word of honour that this explanation could not be right. But now, seeing your incomprehensible obstinacy, I'm about to lose even the slightest desire to stick up for you in any way at all. And also, your job is not the most secure. Originally, I intended to tell you all this in private, but since you've made me waste my time here for nothing, I don't see why your parents shouldn't hear this too. Your performance of late has been extremely unsatisfactory. I know it's not the best season for doing business, we all recognize that, but a season for not doing any business? There is no such thing. Mr. Samsa, such a thing cannot be tolerated. But sir cried Gregor, beside himself, in his excitement for getting everything else. I'm, I'm just opening up, in a minute. It's just a slight indisposition, a dizzy spell prevented me from getting up. I'm still in bed, but I already feel fine, I swear. I'm just getting out of bed, please just be patient for a minute. I'm not as well as I thought yet, but really, I'm, I'm fine. How something like this could just take a person by surprise? Isn't that crazy? Only last night I was fine. My parents can tell you. Oh, wait, wait. Last night I already had a slight premonition. They must have been able to tell just by looking at me. Why didn't I report it to the office? But you always think that you'll get over a sickness without staying home. Sir, please, just spare my parents. There's no basis for any of the accusations that you're making against me. No one has ever said a word to me about them. Perhaps you haven't seen the last orders I sent in. Anyway, I'm still going on the road with the 8 o'clock train. These few hours of rest have done me good. Don't let me keep you, sir. I'll be at the office myself right away. And please be so kind as to tell them this and give my respect to the head of the firm. And while Gregor hastily blurted all of this out, hardly knowing what he was saying, he had easily approached the chest of drawers, probably as a result of the practice he had already gotten in bed, and now he tried to raise himself up against it. He actually intended to open the door, actually present himself and speak to the manager, 
He was eager to find out what the others, who were now so anxious to see him, would say at the sight of him. If they were shocked, then Gregor had no further responsibility and could be calm. But if they took everything calmly, then he too had no reason to get excited and could, if he hurried, actually be at the station by 8 o'clock. At first, he slid off the polished chest of drawers a few times, but at last, giving himself a final push, he stood upright. He no longer paid any attention to the pains in his abdomen, no matter how much they were burning. Now, he let himself fall against the back of a nearby chair, clinging to its slats with his little legs. But by doing this, he had gotten control of himself and fell silent, since he could now listen to what the manager was saying. Did you understand a word? The manager was asking his parents. He isn't trying to make a fool of us, is he? My God, cried his mother, already in tears. Maybe he's seriously ill and here we are just torturing him. She then cried. Mother, called his sister from the other side. They communicated by way of Gregor's room. Go to the doctors immediately. Gregor must be sick. Hurry, get the doctor. Did you just hear Gregor talking? That was the voice of an animal, said the manager in a tone conspicuously soft, compared with the mother's yelling. Anna? Anna? The father called through the foyer into the kitchen, clapping his hands. Get a locksmith right away. And already the two girls were running with rustling skirts through the foyer. How could his sister have gotten dressed so quickly? and tearing open the door to the apartment. The door could not be heard slamming. They had probably left it open, as is the custom in homes where a great misfortune has occurred. But Gregor had become much calmer. It was true that they no longer understood his words, though they had seemed clear enough to him, clearer than before, probably because his ears had grown accustomed to them. But still, the others now believed that there was something the matter with him and were ready to help him. The assurance and confidence with which the first measure had been taken really did him good. He finally felt integrated into human society once again and hoped for marvellous, amazing feats from both the doctor and the locksmith, without really distinguishing sharply between them. In order to make his voice as clear as possible for the crucial discussions that were approaching, he cleared his throat a little, taking pains, of course, to do so in a very muffled manner, since this noise, too, might sound different from a human cough, a thing he no longer trusted himself to decide. In the next room, meanwhile, everything had become completely still. Perhaps his parents were sitting at the table with the manager, whispering, Perhaps they were all leaning against the door and listening. Gregor slowly lugged himself towards the door, pushing the chair in front of him, then let go of it, threw himself against the door, held himself upright against it. The pads on the bottom of his little legs exuded a little sticky substance and for a moment rested there from the exertion. But then he got started turning the key in the lock with his mouth. Unfortunately, it seemed that he had no real teeth. What was he supposed to grip the key with? But, in compensation, his jaws, of course, were very strong. With their help, he actually got the key moving and paid no attention to the fact that he was undoubtedly hurting himself in some way because a brown liquid came flowing out of his mouth, flowed over the key, and dripped onto the floor. Listen said the manager in the next room. He's turning the key. This was great encouragement to Gregor, but everyone should have cheered him on, his father and mother too. Go, Gregor, they should have called. Keep going at that lock. Harder, harder. And in the delusion that they were all following his efforts with suspense, he clamped his jaws madly on the key with all of the strength he could muster. Depending on the progress of the key, he danced around the lock, holding himself upright only by his mouth. He clung to the key, as the situation demanded, or pressed it down again with the whole weight of his body. The clearer click of the lock as it finally snapped back literally woke Gregor up. 
With a sigh of relief, he said to himself, So I guess I didn't need the locksmith after all, and laid his head down on the handle in order to open wide one wing of the double doors. Since he had to use this method of opening the door, it was really opened very wide while he himself was still invisible. He first had to edge slowly around the one wing of the door and do so very carefully if he was not to fall flat on his back just before entering. He was still busy with this difficult maneuver and had no time to pay attention to anything else when he heard the manager burst out with a loud, Oh? It sounded like a rush of wind. And now he could see him standing closest to the door, his hand pressed over his open mouth, slowly backing away as if repulsed by an invisible, unrelenting force. His mother, in spite of the manager's presence, she stood with her hair still unbraided from the night, sticking out in all directions, first looked at his father with her hands clasped, then took two steps towards Gregor and sank down in the midst of her skirts spread out around her, her face completely hidden on her breast. With a hostile expression, his father clenched his fist as if to drive Gregor back into his room, then looked uncertainly around the living room, shielded his eyes with his hands and sobbed with heaves of his powerful chest. Now, Gregor did not enter the room after all, but leaned against the inside of the firmly bolted wing of the door, so that only half his body was visible and his head above it, cocked to one side and peeping out at the others. In the meantime, it had grown much lighter. Across the street, one could clearly see a section of the endless greyish-black buildings opposite. It was a hospital, with its regular windows starkly piercing the facade. The rain was still coming down, but only in large, separate visible drops that were also pelting the ground literally one at a time. The breakfast dishes were laid out lavishly on the table, since for his father, breakfast was the most important meal of the day, which he would prolong for hours while reading various newspapers. On the wall directly opposite hung a photograph of Gregor from his army days, in a lieutenant's uniform, his hand on his sword, a carefree smile on his lips, demanding respect for his bearing and his rank. The door to the foyer was open, and since the front door was open too, it was possible to see out onto the landing and the top of the stairs going down. Well, said Gregor, and he was thoroughly aware of being the only one who had kept calm. Well, said Gregor, and he was thoroughly aware of being the only one who had kept calm. I'll get dressed right away, pack up my samples, and go. Will you, um, will you please let me go? Now, sir, that you see, I'm not stubborn, and I'm actually willing to work. Yes, traveling is a hardship, but without it, I couldn't live. Where are you going, sir? To the office? Yes? Will you give an honest report of everything? A man might find for a moment that he was unable to work, but that's exactly the right time to remember his past accomplishments and to consider that later on, when the obstacles have been removed. He's bound to work all the harder and more efficiently. I'm under so many obligations to the head of the firm, as you know very well. Besides, I also have my parents and my sister to worry about. So, you know, I'm in a tight spot, but I'll also work my way out again. Don't make things harder for me than they already are. Please, just stick up for me in the office. Traveling salesmen aren't well liked there, I know. People think they make a fortune leading the gay life. No one has any particular reason to rectify this prejudice. But you, sir, you have a better perspective on things than the rest of the office. An even better perspective, and, you know, this is just between the two of us, than the head of the firm himself, who in his capacity as owner easily lets his judgment be swayed against an employee. And you also know very well that the traveling salesman who is out of the office practically the whole year round can so easily become the victim of gossip, coincidences, and unfounded accusations, against which he's completely unable to defend himself, since in most cases 
He knows nothing at all about them except when he returns, exhausted from a trip, and back home gets to suffer on his own person the grim consequences, which can no longer be traced back to their causes. Sir, don't go away without a word to tell me you think I'm at least partly right. But at Gregor's first words, the manager had already turned away and with curled lips looked back at Gregor only over his twitching shoulder. And during Gregor's speech, he did not stand still for even a minute, but without letting Gregor out of his sight, backed towards the door, yet very gradually, as if there were some secret prohibition against leaving the room. He was already in the foyer, and from the sudden movement with which he took his last step from the living room, one might have thought he had just burned the sole of his foot. In the foyer, however, he stretched his hand far out towards the staircase, as if nothing less than an unearthly deliverance were awaiting him there. Gregor realized that he must on no account let the manager go away in this mood if his position in the firm were not to be jeopardized in the extreme. His parents did not understand this too well. In the course of the years, they had formed the conviction that Gregor was just set for life in this firm, and furthermore, they were so preoccupied with their immediate troubles that they had lost all consideration for the future. But Gregor had this forethought. The manager must be detained, calmed down, convinced, and finally won over. Gregor and his family's future depended on it. If only his sister had been there, she was perceptive. She had already begun to cry when Gregor was still lying calmly on his back, and certainly the manager, this lady's man, would have listened to her. She would have shut the front door and in the foyer talked him out of his scare, but his sister was not there. Gregor had to handle the situation himself, and without stopping to realize that he had no idea what his new faculties of movement were, and without stopping to realize either that his speech had possibly, indeed probably, not been understood again. He let go of the wing of the door, he shoved himself through the opening, intending to go to the manager who was already on the landing, ridiculously holding onto the banisters with both hands, but groping for support. Gregor immediately fell down with a little cry onto his numerous little legs. This had hardly happened when for the first time that morning he had a feeling of physical well-being. His little legs were on firm ground, they actually obeyed him completely as he noted to his joy. They even strained to carry him away whenever he wanted to go, and he already believed that final recovery from all his suffering was imminent. But at that very moment, as he lay on the floor, rocking with repressed motion, not far from his mother and just opposite her, she, who had seemed so completely self-absorbed, all at once jumped up. Her arms stretched wide, her fingers spread, and cried, Help, for God's sake, help! She held her head bent as if to see Gregor better, but inconsistently darted madly backwards instead had forgotten that the table laden with the breakfast dishes stood behind her, sat down on it hastily as if her thoughts were elsewhere, when she reached it and did not seem to notice at all that near her the big coffee pot had been knocked over and coffee was pouring in a steady stream onto the rug. Mother? Mother? said Gregor softly and looked up at her. For a minute, the manager had completely slipped his mind. On the other hand, at the sight of the spilling coffee, he could not resist snapping his jaw several times in the air. At this, his mother screamed once more, fled from the table, and fell into the arms of his father, who came rushing up to her. But Gregor had no time now for his parents. The manager was already on the stairs, with his chin on the banister. He was taking a last look back. Gregor was off to a running start to be as sure as possible of catching up with him. The manager must have suspected something like this, for he leaped down several steps and disappeared. But still he shouted, Ah! And the sound carried through the whole staircase. 
Unfortunately, the manager's flight now seemed to confuse his father completely, who had been relatively calm until for now, who had been relatively calm until now, for instead of running after the manager himself, or at least not hindering Gregor in his pursuit, he seized in his right hand the manager's cane, which had been left behind on a chair with his hat and overcoat, picked up in his left hand a heavy newspaper from the table, and, stamping his feet, started brandishing the cane and the newspaper to drive Gregor back into his room. No plea of Gregor was helped. No plea was even understood. However humbly he might turn his head, his father merely stamped his feet more forcefully. Across the room, his mother had thrown open a window in spite of the cool weather, and leaning out, she buried her face far outside the window, inside her hands. Between the alley and the staircase, a strong draft was created. The window curtains blew in, the newspapers on the table rustled, single sheets fluttered across the floor. Pitilessly, his father came on, hissing like a wild man. Now, Gregor had not had any practice at all walking in reverse. It was really very slow going. If Gregor had only been allowed to turn around, he could have gotten into his room right away, but he was afraid to make his father impatient by this time-consuming gyration, and at any minute the cane in his father's hand threatened to come down on his back or his head with a deadly blow. Finally, however, Gregor had no choice, for he noticed with horror that in reverse he could not even keep going in one direction, and so incessantly throwing uneasy side glances at his father, he began to turn around as quickly as possible, in reality turning only very slowly. Perhaps his father realized his good intentions, for he did not interfere with him. Instead, he even now and then directed the maneuver from afar with the tip of his cane. If only his father did not keep making this intolerable hissing sound, it made Gregor lose his head completely. He'd almost finished the turn when, his mind continually on this hissing, he made a mistake and even started turning back around to his original position. But when he had at last successfully managed to get his head in front of the open door, it turned out that his body was too broad to get through as it was. Of course, in his father's present state of mind, it did not even remotely occur to him to open the other wing of the door in order to give Gregor enough room to pass through. He had only the fixed idea that Gregor must return to his room as quickly as possible. He would never have allowed the complicated preliminaries Gregor needed to go through in order to stand up on one end and perhaps this way fit through the door. Instead, he drove Gregor on, as if there were no obstacle, with exceptional loudness. The voice behind Gregor did not sound like that of only a single father. Now, this was really no joke anymore, and Gregor forced himself, come what may, into the doorway. One side of his body rose up. He lay lopsided in the opening. One of his flanks was scraped raw. Ugly blotches marred the white door. Soon he got stuck and could not have budged any more by himself. His little legs on one side dangled tremblingly in mid-air. Those on the other were painfully crushed against the door. When, from behind, his father gave him a hard shove, which was truly his salvation, and, bleeding profusely, he flew far into his room. The door was slammed shut with the cane. Then, at last, everything was quiet.